Hey, Dave, welcome to the Stark Reflections podcast. Well, thank you. It's nice to be here. I am uh, so thrilled to have you on my podcast. I realized even though I had interviewed you before for other podcasts, I've never actually had you on mine uh, officially as a guest, uh, other than short tidbits we'd done together at, at Superstars, I think. So yeah. You're, you've been writing for a long, long time. Can, can you just give my listeners a bit of a background as to where it all started for, for Dave as, as a writer? Well, I started, gosh, um, I started writing when I was 17. Uh, it wasn't until I got into college and I was a pre-medical microbiology major and I decided that I wanted to be a writer and I got serious about it uh, at about the age of 25, 26. Um, and when I was 27, I won, uh, I decided I wanted to win a, a short story contest. And so I entered several of them and I won them all. Um, and uh, one all. of them was the Writers of the Future contest. And that was a big international contest. And, and we had the awards ceremony on top of the uh, World Trade Center. And uh, I won the grand prize there. And I had eight different publishers that approached me and asked if they could see my first book. And so within the next two weeks, I had uh, uh, a novel proposal out to my, uh, to a new agent. Um, and uh, that book went on and became a bestseller. Um, and that kind of got my career up and going. What, uh, what, which novel was that? That was that first that was called on my way to paradise. Um, based upon the short story that I won the Writers of the Future with. Oh, really? You expanded upon the short story? Yeah. Yeah. I just turned that into the first couple of chapters and kept on going. Wow. Uh, so you won Writers of the Future uh, on top of the World Trade Center. <laughs> yes. I won Writers of the Future on top of the World Trade Center. And and, and there just, was a big publisher there that met yeah. you? Yeah, we had uh, we had several of them that came in. Um, what what had happened was that um, uh, a couple of people had uh, read the story. A couple of judges from Writers of the Future, and they called their agents and editors and said, "Hey, you gotta you gotta pay attention to this guy. We've got this guy coming to the to the World Trade Center." And and so I I literally had, and I I didn't know it. But but that was Robert Silverberg uh, and wow. Al Just Andrus and a couple of other authors wow. had done the same thing. And so when we when we had the uh, award ceremony, I had a very receptive audience. I guess is about the easiest way to put it. I had several publishers that came up, um, and uh, and it was really a, a matter of choosing which ones to to go with. Uh, I had uh, I, I went to an agent uh, that I had picked. I picked her out of the phone book, Virginia Kid, and called her. And uh, she says, "Well, I haven't taken a new client in twelve years, but um, yeah, send it to me." And uh, so uh, so she became my agent, and uh, she she asked me to select you know the top three because she didn't want to get into a big fist fight, and she thought <laughs> it would put too much pressure on me to have a. Uh, an auction at such a tender age. Um, but uh, anyway, so we went and, and did a little bit of an auction and we, we uh, just went for uh, three different publishers and, and the deals all came in, you know, very close to the same, but uh, she wanted to go with Bantam Spectra at the time, which uh, had better distribution than the other publishers. And so, um, so we went with Bantam uh, and they, up to their offer a little bit and things like that. And it was very, very quick and easy to do. Uh, and then I wrote, uh, I wrote the book based upon On My Way to Paradise, got great reviews, um, won the Philip K. Dick Award for one of the best novels of the year for the, the Philip K. Dick Memorial Special Award. I should give the full name. Um, and, um, and basically that uh, helped me launch the book. I, I came out, uh, I think I came out uh, number four on the science fiction bestseller list and wow. uh, went up to number two the next month and uh, just kind of kept building steam. Um, and so I did really well on my sales and, and turned into a bestseller and that kind of set the tone for my career. Wow. Uh, I want to, I'm, I'm kind of skipping ahead, but you uh -huh. mentioned uh, getting that start through Writers of the Future, and I do know that you are at the center of, of new writers coming in because 
there are all of the judges, but mm. I think you're playing a role in like the initial curation role of yeah. putting the anthologies together. Yeah. I'm the uh, I'm the coordinating judge, and so when the stories come in, um, I used to be the first reader until just uh, last year, and yeah. then we we got a Carrie English as the new first reader, just because it got to be such a big job. The contest keeps growing. It's now the largest contest in the world, I think, yeah. uh, in writing contests. I've, I've checked in uh, in India and England and a number of other countries and can't find any bigger. So <laughs> I think yeah. we might be. But uh, if not the biggest, we're one of the biggest. Um, in any case, uh, yeah. So then uh, I choose which ones, which stories will be the finalists and pass them on to the judges. And then the judges choose which ones will be the prize winners. If we have problems, uh, for example, if we've got a tie for, let's say, first place or second or third place, then I'm the tiebreaker. Um, and so I can't have seen the stories before. So I, I don't take stories from my students as far as I know. Uh, right. well, every once in a while, some, I mean, anybody can enter uh, anywhere in the world. So every once in a while, uh, serious writers uh, who happen to be my students will will end up winning, but I, they're all judged blind, so I have no way of knowing uh, who right. wrote the stories or anything like that, or what your age or gender or uh, ethnicity or what language you speak natively happens to be. We had a winner from, um, oh gosh, where was she from? Uh, we had a winner from one of the uh, Eastern Bloc countries here just recently. Oh wow! Uh, who wrote a beautiful story, and uh, and I wouldn't have guessed that she wasn't a native English speaker. Wow. Well, I have I have my own uh, writers of the future story to share, and I don't know if you know. Uh, I have to I have to go grab it because for some reason I'm drawing a weird blank. Um, with uh, where is it here? Um, this is uh, Stephen Kotowicz had submitted a story to me when I was supposed to be editing an anthology of Canadian science fiction. Mm -hmm. And uh, we were having issues with the publisher. So I was in, I, I pulled the book from the publisher because of issues with it never happening and people not getting paid and was looking for another publisher. And I, I remember seeing him in person at back of Phoenix books at a book event and went, Stephen, glad you're here send this somewhere else. This is a brilliant story. And it was the, the winning story about, you know, playing music off the rings of Saturn um, mm -hmm. with, with that one. And, and I was so thrilled that he took that story, submitted it to writers of the future. And I'm sure you're familiar with, <laughs> with what happens mm -hmm. then. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, we, we, uh, I love it when, uh, when one of our past winners, you know, uh, point someone our direction you know I've, I've done it a number of times too I I had a neighbor across the street who was an illustrator and um, so I talked to him and said go go win this contest and uh, <laughs> and get it. you know uh, it was it was as simple as that so uh, I try to put as much great new talent as I can towards the contest because we do have contests for writers and for illustrators and so we've got some fantastic artwork coming in from so all why, over the world. why i mean why would you dedicate so much time to helping prop up beginning writers you know um it started out as a, a hobby um and uh, you know i've i've done a lot of different kinds of things i was a uh, I was a prison guard at one point in my life and a missionary and studied medicine and, you know, um, and, and I find that um, I, I just really enjoy helping other people uh, and I don't care what capacity it's in. I'll help you change your tire if you need me to, <laughs> you know, but, uh, but I think that there's something built in my DNA that says, yeah, you, you've, you've got to you do that. And I think that one of the best things that I can do is, is to help through training. And so I spend an awful lot of time uh, helping train other people. Uh, my wife often asks, you know, are you a writer or a teacher? And the answer is yes, uh, because <laughs> um, I, I keep wanting to teach, you know. And, and I know that uh, even from a young age, I, I thought very strongly about going into education uh, on, on a permanent basis. Wow. Well, um, I have to say on behalf of writers out there, I really appreciate that you do that. 
um, through writers of the future, through uh, superstars writing seminars, um, mm -hmm. through the uh, Apex Writers Workshop, which I know we're going to talk about and I want to ask you about soon. But I want to go back and, and, you know, publicly say thank you because I was working on uh, a novel uh, set in uh, Los Angeles uh, where I have a character working on a movie set and having gone to your lectures and, 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 and learned so much from you about the way that writers can license their IP, not just to a publisher or self-publishing or eBooks, but for games as well as for Hollywood, because I know you have experience there. Can you talk a little bit about, you know, writers opening their minds to the possibility of, you know, uh, selling their right. Cause you've, you've, you've sold to games as well, right? Yeah. Yeah. In fact, I, I just wrote a, a, a short story for a big company called PUBG, uh, which is one of the biggest uh, game companies in the world. They, they were the top selling game in 2017 and 2018. And uh, they've got about 400 million players per month who come on Wow, uh, 600 million players total. So so I've got a, a story that will be coming up in six parts over six weeks that will be uh, played, put out in 24 different languages, uh, given away for free uh, to a huge audience. Um, I helped create a game called uh, StarCraft Brood Wars, which is uh, still played in the World Championship of Video Game Tournaments uh, in the final round. Uh, and so, uh, you know, if you happen to be living on the Pacific Rim, everybody knows what that game is and, and that kind of thing. But, you know, the idea here is that storytelling, whether it's in the form of a, a short story or an epic novel or in a, a movie or a television series or a video game, it doesn't really matter. It's all storytelling. OK, um, in fact, I, I studied to be a painter at one point. And even painting is storytelling. You know, you tell a story in the in the illustration and the painting that you're that you're putting together. And so, um, uh, I just I just try to tell writers, God, don't don't lock yourself in. You know, if if you think that you're just uh, uh, going to be writing a novel, you're probably uh, short selling yourself. You know, you should go ahead and look at it from the point of view of, hey, I'm a writer. I can do any of this. And, uh, and that's how you make a living. When, when we write a story, we are creating an, an intellectual property, which we then sell globally uh, in different forms. I can sell it as a novel, as a series of novels, uh, audio books. I can sell it to video games, movies, TV series. And, and so you want to learn how to do all of that. You know, it's just... Uh, It'll, it'll add a little bit of extra time to your, uh, to your learning cycle, but it'll have huge payoffs. <laughs> What's, uh, what are some of the misperceptions that you constantly have to <laughs> help writers understand about, about those other properties? Well, I think there's a lot of misconceptions all through this. You know, a big misconception is that you can't make a living as a writer. And I find that people who don't know how to make a living as a writer can't. You know, uh, if you if you, if you don't know where the money is, you aren't going to find it. You know, it, it's 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 like an Easter eggs are out there. You know, for example, when I when I put a book out and I send it out to my agent, my agent sends it out to twenty different countries around the world. If the book takes off in one or two or three of those countries, the chances are are up tremendously that uh, this book will go big in in maybe half a dozen, maybe all of them. And you never know which property, uh, which country your, your book will go big in. I have a lady that I, I used to know, I was in a writing group with her. She quit writing because her books weren't selling and she was writing little vampire novels. Her book became the number one best-selling book in Romania. She made millions of dollars in Romania after she quit writing. Uh, and later on when Twilight became popular, uh, suddenly, 15 years later, her books pop up in hardcover here in the United States, and she makes millions more on them wow. after she gave up. And that's the problem with writers is we don't see things in the long term. We don't see the global market. And so um, uh, and we don't also see, you know, a lot of people don't see the possibilities of turning things into TV series and movie series and stuff like that. You know, I've, I've got a 
a property that I've got three studios that are going to be meeting on it next week, trying to decide what to do with it. You know, the fact that I've got three studios trying to decide whether it's a movie series or a TV series or, you know, that's really great. They might just decide that they should walk away from it. But, uh, but, you know, as you get that kind of excitement going, chances are good that something's going to come out of it. Wow. And that, and that is amazing. Cause I think, I mean, it's, it's a dream for so many writers to have a property, like people wanting the property in such yeah. a way, but a lot of that happens where there's um, um, offers are made or um, uh, what do you call it? Where, where they're reserving the right to make something, but they don't end up getting made like one in a hundred gets made or something like that. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, we, we get options on them uh, and we sell options. And, you know, you can sell an option on a book and the movie doesn't get made. You still get paid money for the option. You know, right. what, they're, what they're buying is they're buying the, the right to buy the book. They can, say, they can say, yeah, we don't want anybody else making this movie. We want to make it. So we're going to pay you, say, $50,000 this year to not have let anybody else make that movie, to just kind of hold it on the shelf. And, and there are certain movies that are kind of famous for that. For example, Isaac Asimov's Foundation series, you know, was optioned in 1963. And it keeps making money year after year being optioned by major studios who then discover that, gosh, you can't really make a good visual movie out of this, um, no. out of this intellectual feast. You know, uh, it, we're, we're appealing to different things. And so, um, yeah, it'll probably never make any money, but it's made millions of dollars already uh, just on option money. Wow. Uh, and I know, for example, uh, from the indie author space, Hugh Howey of uh, Wool, mm -hmm. Ridley mm -hmm. Scott optioned Wool, Ridley Scott also optioned The Martian. Uh, mm -hmm. The Martian got made, obviously, <laughs> and Wool. I'm not sure where that stands now. I haven't ch uh, chatted with uh, with Hugh in a while, but um, but there's usually a renewal clause every three to five years or something like that, right? Yeah, yeah, and uh, and so every three to five years, you it's, it'll it'll get uh, renewed. You know, you can have an option that sells for a week. Uh, you know, I've I've told okay. people, yeah, okay, you can go out and you can talk to so and so, and uh, and we'll have an option for a week. And then at that end of that time, if you don't have a deal, uh, you know, then I can go out and sell it elsewhere. So options can last, you know, heck you could have one for a day, I suppose. Right. But um, I usually like to give them a week because, you know, that's enough time for them to hang themselves, you know. Um, <laughs> but, but, you know, some authors make a lot of money. For example, Philip K. Dick has written a thousand short stories. My agent handles his stuff. He's always got options for Philip K. Dick, and usually he has more than 100 going at a time. And so Philip K. Dick is making a lot of money uh, on movie options every year, right. even though maybe his books aren't selling, you know, gangbusters at this point. But and, and talk about a genius short story writer, too. Um, uh, yeah. Absolutely. Uh, so and so many amazing films based on his short fiction. Um, yeah. How does so so how does that work? So you said your agent uh, represents the, the Philip K. Dick's estate uh, or or properties. Um, do you when if 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 you're interacting with Hollywood, is it the same agent? Is it a different agent, or is this that your agent happens to know both worlds? Well, my agent has a little bit. I, I think any literary agent will, in time, have to develop some sort of ability to handle those, uh, those uh, contracts. Because what happens is you put a book out there, movie producers read it, maybe their daughter reads it or the mom reads it or something like that. The movie producer then contacts the rights holder and, uh, and they usually go through the literary agent. Okay. You can have agents in Hollywood. You know, there are, uh, there are Hollywood agents who represent novels and you could possibly go that way. Uh, and you could even go uh, instead of a, a literary agent, you could go to a rights manager is what they're called. And they usually only have maybe half a dozen or a dozen different clients. And, uh, and they, they work really hard to sell your works in particular. Um, so you can, you can go with your typical literary agent. Uh, my literary agent, for example, has a Hollywood attorney that he works with so that if there are questions about a contract, then he can talk to the Hollywood attorney. Um, 
or if I need to, um, I've even hired my Hollywood attorney to look over contracts, you know, but they charge like $2,000 an hour. So you don't want to hire them on a Whoa. regular basis unless you've just got money to burn, you know? Yeah. Um, so, yeah. Wow. Wow. So, so, so many things to get into, but I am curious to find out because um, uh, you, you run these online, I mean, you have a lot of online resources for writers, but mm -hmm. I'm really intrigued to dig into the Apex Writers Group and what that is and how, I mean, we can take advantage of that in this virtual <laughs> pandemic yeah. world. Well, you know, I, I got the idea last year. I just felt like a lot of writers that I know who are good writers are kind of stagnating. And I, I started looking at them and I realized that they the thing that they lacked was they didn't have good writing groups. You know, um, if you look at J.R.R. Tolkien, you know, he had the Inklings. And if you looked at, uh, at what was going on with uh, uh, Ernest Hemingway, you know, he was writing to other authors who were of his caliber, who all also won Nobel Prizes. And, uh, and so it's, it's writing groups, it's authors educating each other, I think is really helpful. And so I wanted to create a way where authors could, A, inspire each other, uh, get into writing groups, do brainstorming together, do writing sprints together, that kind of thing. And then I also wanted to educate them. And so I gave them access to all of my writing courses so that they can uh, study a writing course together, get three or four people and say, hey, let's do writing enchanting prose or something like that. And then I wanted to bring in better resources. So I, I'm bringing in um, the people from Hollywood, for example. We're doing Hollywood Month this month. Uh, so tomorrow I'm going to be having a producer and director who will be talking, Spanky Ward. And then, uh, then come Tuesday, I've got the head of Lionsgate Entertainment uh, for their, for their uh, 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 television division. Um, so he's going to talk about how you make a TV series. And, uh, and so I really want to get top people from around the world and, and do that and then kind of create a brain trust. Um, I'm trying to get uh, as many well-educated people in the field as possible into this group so that, hey, if you've got a problem and you, for example, need an expert on uh, rights management, you know, we have Mark here who can answer your questions and, um, and uh, help each other out. So the idea here is that um, I really wanted to create the world's best writing group put it put it that way <laughs> i don't think small okay um so that's what that's what apex is and then do it for a, ma a, a manageable price you know uh, we're charging 300 dollars a year uh, there are other people who are doing something similar but they're charging like five times as much or even almost 10 times as much in some cases and i'm like yeah for what what I'm giving, I'm trying to create a bargain. You know, I want right, people to right. look at it and say, this is the best investment I ever made. That's, that's the goal. And I imagine that there's got to be some criteria. And I mean, you have to apply to get in. How does it, how does a writer find out more about that? Or, you know, I started doing that and, uh, and I found that really only serious people are trying to get in anyway. Uh, so okay. for right now, <laughs> I'm just like, okay, if they're serious enough that they're willing to, in that they're investing time and money into their career, then I figure they're probably good. And, and so far, that has held true. I haven't, I haven't seen any bums in there um, hanging around, you know. Um, I, <laughs> well, I suppose that, that could become a problem <laughs> later on, well, I, but right now it's not. And I suspect you you have a bit of a track record for recognizing young writers that go on to success. And uh, not not to not to name drop, but uh, there are a couple of your proteges that have moved on to superstardom. Can you can you mention a few of those? Yeah. Well, I, I years ago, uh, for example, I was asked I was asked by Scholastic to help them choose a book to push big. I chose the book Harry Potter, and uh, created the marketing campaign that made it the best selling book of all time. Um, in English, at least. Um, and uh, so and then I had Stephanie Meyer in my writing class. Uh, we, we sat down together and had a meeting where we talked about how you would create the best selling young adult novel of all time. And uh, Twilight grew out of that. Brandon Sanderson, uh, who just made $7 million on his latest Kickstarter for his, uh, uh, for his collectible uh, 
a book, the 10 year anniversary for the way of Kings uh, was in my very first writing class at BYU. So I've, I've done that, you know, quite a, quite a bit. I've got about a hundred different writers who have been on the New York times bestseller list at this point. So wow. I just keep on doing it. Yeah. I, I enjoy doing it. It doesn't hurt me as a writer to have that competition, you know, um, when somebody like Rowling comes in and, and uh, creates uh, 40 million new readers in the United States, um, quite frankly, that just helps all of us, you know, oh, yeah. <laughs> a, a rising tide, you know, yeah. uh, floats all boats. So uh, we're, we, do, we do good when that happens. Oh, fantastic. Now I want to wrap this back to your, your writing specifically. Mm -hmm. And uh, you use uh, two different names uh, for writing. So you've got Dave Wolverton and you've got mm -hmm. David Farland. How did those uh, originate? Well, you know, I was, um, uh, I was on my third novel and I got a really nice review that said, oh, go look down on the bottom shelf of the bookstores where David Farland or Dave Wolverton's books are, are likely to be found. And I, I remembered that I had read a, a a survey that had been done by Campbell Soups a few years earlier. And they found that 92% of all people wouldn't stoop over to pick up their favorite can of soup off the bottom shelf. And I thought, I've got to get off the bottom shelf. <laughs> and so, <laughs> uh, so I, I called my publisher and I said, I want to change my name. And uh, then they were like, what too? And I was like, anything that puts me at eye level. And I, I went to uh, 10 different bookstores and uh, looked to see where I would be. And F-A to F-E uh, looked like a really good spot. And I started trying to think of names that started with that. And um, turned out I had a girl that really liked me in college whose last name was Farland. And I thought, that's kind of perfect. And I, I had, uh, uh, and actually I had a great, 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 great grandmother whose last name was, was Mick Farland. And I thought, well, somebody, somebody was named Farland in the family back there. So, um, so I just decided that Farland sounded like a great name, especially for a fantasy author. Oh and yeah. It, Farland. <laughs> yeah. It, it, it had some virtues. It, it, it's easy to, to pronounce. It's short so that uh, it gets printed big on a book. Mm -hmm. And, um, and, uh, and I think it has good resonance within the genre. So, uh, so I chose Farland as a, as a pen name. Um, but I think if you're writing for, and, and especially since I was going to be writing a big fantasy, I'd been writing science fiction and I love a lot of different genres, but I'd always wanted to write fantasy and I had written 10 science fiction novels in a row and I really wanted to go write a big fat fantasy and, and kind of break out a little bit. Cool. So do, 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 are the books now, uh, as they're getting reprinted or republished, is it Dave Farland writing as uh, Dave Wolverton writing as Dave Farland or any, no? no, no, just David Farland. Yep. Consistently now across the board. Consistently. Yeah. And in fact, I, I pretty much, um, I'm pretty much abandoning, uh, the Wolverton name. Um, just but he got, you, but he got you that first big hit. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> Don't leave it, him behind. <laughs> it's like it's well, it, it confuses people. Yeah, I get yeah. a lot of I get a lot of letters. I've I've gotten them as late as you know a couple of weeks ago. Somebody wrote and said, you know, years ago I used to have a favorite author named Dave Wolverton, and then he just disappeared, and and uh, so I got this new author named David Farland, and I just found out they're both the same person. You know, <laughs> I like and, his. <laughs> yeah. And I'm like, okay, uh, that seemed to me to be an argument to go ahead and merge the names now. Okay, cool. Well, then I, I know for sure to, to use uh, David Farland on the, uh, as I'm pushing the episode of this go. podcast. Yeah, that works good. <laughs> so uh -huh. um, where can people find out more about David Farland or about the Apex writing series? And again, you have these uh, daily email prompts and things that are still mm -hmm. available. People can sign up for free. Where can they get all this good stuff? Yeah. Okay, so if you go to www.mystorydoctor.com, and uh, if you go there, uh, you can sign up for my free writing tips. I've got a book, 400 pages of my favorite writing tips. I've been doing them for 13 years now, uh, and uh, I send them out a couple of times a week. I'll send out writing tips, uh, and that's a great place to go to just get some free swag and, uh, and that kind of thing. Um, you can also find out about Apex there. 
and I'm just getting ready to put out a new class called 318R. It's the class that I taught to Stephanie Meyer and Brandon Sanderson and Dan Wells and, and a number of other people who became. Oh, wait, Dan Wells was one of your students too? Yeah. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah. And uh, uh, yeah, that uh, Dan Wells, um, gosh, I could, I could go on. I've got a list of about a hundred of them who've, uh, who've gone on to, to some acclaim. Um, but the, the idea was that, you know, I, I thought, God, I had so much fun teaching those and the students did so well. So I started to put this together and uh, quite frankly, I, I just had to call up my um, web uh, site provider and upgrade my website because I was crashing because too many people are trying to get into the class. Um, <laughs> so anyway, um, but yeah, so we're going to, I'm going to go ahead and I'm going to teach it online and, and just teach it on Saturdays. Uh, and, and I love teaching online because I have people all over the world who say, oh man, I would die to get in your class. So I've got a bunch of people in Australia and Japan and China, you know, who are saying, okay, we want to take this class. You know, can you, can you, can you teach one in the evening? And I'm like, sure, I can teach them in the evening. I, it doesn't, <laughs> it doesn't yeah. matter I, uh, as long as I'm still awake. So I'm going to, I'm going to go ahead and, and have one in the morning and one in the evening. And, uh, and then people can come in and audit the class and, and auditing the class means you don't have to do the assignments and take the quizzes and all of that stuff, but you can just come in and watch, you know, and so we've got uh, people who will be able to audit the classes too. Wow. Well, David, uh, thank you so much for sharing so many insights and um, wisdom and, and obviously uh, access to some fantastic resources. And thank you for, for being such a mentor to so many of us. Well, thank you. I really appreciate it. It's good talking to you. <laughs>